the morning. We got a backdrop of Trump having COVID. Everyone obviously knows it. He's still going to be working like a good trooper. But here we got question period. And um, I, there's a lot of um, MPs that, uh, especially conservative, who, I, who, who don't normally get to speak. So it's a little interesting because it's a little different, little angle. Check it out. Oral questions. Questions are honorable leader of opposition. The honorable gov- uh, opposition house leader. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the official opposition's leader and the Prime Minister, uh, would, we would like to wish a speedy recovery to the U.S. President and his wife, who have been infected by COVID-19. Given the situation, we see that there's a very fast test in the U.S., but in Canada, unfortunately, people have to wait a long time. Apparently, a, a rapid test has just been approved, but that could have been done six, it was done six months ago in the U.S. Why did the government wait so long here? Oh, Parliament Secretary, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 7.9 million tests ordered from Abbott ID. 2.5 million arriving in the next few weeks as late as December 31st. Mr. Speaker, we are working day and night to get these tests approved. Over 7.4 million Canadians have already been tested for COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing a fall resurgence. We must continue to increase laboratory capacity and the number of tests done per day. We will continue to work with provinces and territories to ensure that we can do a high number of tests per day, but also have the resources to do rapid contact tracing and treatment of new cases. Member for Louis Saint Laurent. In the late 90s, Canada created the Global Public Health Intelligent Network to detect possible epidemics, and it worked well. H1N1, SARS, and Zika were all contained. But in 2018, this Liberal government changed its mandate, and as a result, Canada has relied on the WHO instead of Canadian scientists. Why did the government do this? It uh, cost Canada a lot of time. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We were concerned by reports that uh, GFIN analysts were not able to proceed with their very important work, and we will be conducting an independent review of these changes to make sure that this vital tool continues to inform decisions to protect Canadians. Mr. Speaker, from the start of COVID-19 outbreak, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network has been a very important source of public health intelligence. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. This vital tool, as said the Minister, as said the, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary, has been changed his mind because of this Liberal government. This decision has been made by this Liberal gov- government, and now we have to pay this huge price. So does that mean that this government was so incompetent that they cannot recognize our own responsibility in this issue? Yeah. Uh, the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we trust and value science and evidence. We know the importance of public health intelligence in identifying outbreaks, and as I have said, we are concerned about the reports from GFIN analysts that they were unable to proceed with their important work. We have asked for the independent review, and we look forward to their findings, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this week the Liberal government has uh, used in their talking points over and over again the need to quote scientists. So let me quote the government's top scientist to the member across. Dr. Supriya Sharma said that only hundreds of thousands of tests would be arriving up until the end of this year. And to put that into context, Oh, close to 300,000 tests were done in Ontario alone this week. So I'd like to give him the opportunity to correct the record because I believe he just misled the House and the Canadian people. We're not seeing tests until early 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, we did order 7.9 million rapid tests from Abbott ID. The first tests will start to arrive in the next few weeks, with 2.5 million arriving by December 21st, uh, 31st of 2020, and then they will continue to arrive into 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, here's the reality. 
there's such a big backlog in Ontario and Quebec for testing that the Prime Minister is telling people that they're going to have to miss Thanksgiving dinner, that they're not going to be able to go and visit their elderly parents in long-term care facilities. And all this could be corrected if we had the ability to test frequently and get results within 15 minutes, which is what everyone else in the world has. He misled the House. He said that these tests were going to be available now. That we know from reports today that's not happening until 2021. How many more people have to die because of their incompetence? Mr. Speaker, from the beginning, we've worked very closely with provinces and territories. Our Safe Restart Agreement provided $4 billion for provinces and territories to increase testing capacity and contact tracing, with more than $1 billion going to Ontario alone. We were pleased to see the Ontario, the, uh, Ontario update its testing requirements. We will continue working closely with all levels of government. Mr. Speaker, again, 7.9 million rapid tests on their way starting in the coming weeks. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, Quebec is into the second wave of COVID and restaurants and bars are in danger. These small businesses withstood the first lockdown by going into debt, but now thousands of them are at risk of going under. Yesterday, Quebec announced support for fixed costs for businesses forced to close in the red zone. Quebec is doing its part. Now it's the Fed's turn. Quebec wants them to share the cost and enhance its program. Will the government join in with Quebec's assistance? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Bloc Québécois promised elections now, if possible, if not uh, in the spring. They want to have an election on the weekend, if possible. The Bloc is concerned about elections, but we're concerned about the health of Quebecers. There were over a 1,000 cases today, seven deaths, and the Bloc's priority is to go to the polls? Is it really? The Honourable Member for St. Jean. I didn't hear anything there about assistance to small and medium-sized businesses, but one thing's for sure is that loans and debts are no longer a solution. The government has twice made promises to businesses affected by COVID, like restaurants and bars. The, so my question is, when will the federal government deliver on its promise to provide assistance for fixed costs? Last week, they undertook in the throne speech to support businesses forced to close by decision of pu public health. Will the government keep its word and take part in providing support for fixed costs so that businesses can avoid going further into debt? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Bloc Québécois uh, was more concerned about elections. They're going to vote any against anything we present, whether it's for workers or businesses. Any economic plan we present, the Bloc will vote against. The Bloc has abandoned Quebecers, but we never will. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 has hit Canadian families hard, and they are struggling. The Canada's billionaires have seen their wealth skyrocket outrageously during this period, more than $37 billion. We need resources to help people. Many other countries have put in place taxes on wealth, and over two-thirds of Canadian families support that necessity. So why does this government refuse to put in place a wealth tax on Canada's billionaires? Why won't they force Canada's billionaires to pay their fair share? Here, here. Oh, Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely believe that everyone in Canada needs to pay their fair share, all the more so as we are fighting together against a global pandemic. And that is why, in the throne speech, we committed to working to identify additional ways to tax extreme wealth inequality, including by concluding our work to limit the stock option deduction for wealthy individuals at large, established corporations, and, of course, taxing the global digital giants. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have ended the freeze on student loan payments, but they never helped international students or graduate students. They cut almost 40% from the help low-income students got, and there's still the almost billion dollars in supports they promised through CSSG, but buried under their WE scandal. Now, with a second wave of COVID and poor job prospects, the Liberals are forcing students to figure out how to make their loan payments again. Will the Liberals commit to long-term help and, at the very least, permanently remove interest on student debt? 
The Honourable Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question because it's not often enough that we talk about Canada student loans. And I recall when I graduated from university, coming out of university not with only debt, but having accrued interest, which does not put our students in position to succeed. And that's exactly why in Budget 2019, page 44, you will see that Canada student loans, we are putting forward a plan to not only make them interest-free, but to make sure that six-month period is both payment-free and interest-free. And that's in direct response to what students are saying. And that's why exactly in the response to COVID-19, one of the first things we did was freeze interest, put a moratorium on payments. Yes, we will continue working with students and youth. Thank Honourable you. member for Red Deer Lacombe. Yesterday, the Minister of Public Service and Procurement said, and I quote, we revealed on our website at the end of July all of our contracts and suppliers. But yet, Mr. Speaker, I have a document in my hand that says otherwise. In September, the minister's own departmental staff sent an email to a business in my riding who inquired about the status of a contract they had submitted a bid for. The email clearly states that, due to the national security exemption invoked on this procurement contract, award information will not be posted online. Both of these things can be true, Mr. Speaker. So which is it? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, on July 31st, as the Minister said yesterday, we disclosed supplier names and contract values for contracts that Canada has entered into for PPE and medical equipment, except certain commodities that have proved difficult to obtain and where additional procurements may be needed, hence the national security exemption. While we're not able to disclose all details regarding suppliers and contracts at this time, we intend to provide more information at a time when the current level of risk has passed and obviously, of course, Mr. Speaker, with the constant motivation of keeping Canadians and our health professionals safe. Deputy Charlebourg, Saint Charles. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Medical Association is also very concerned about the availability of PPE. Members and experts have been sounding the alarm. 54% of members are still having trouble getting equipment and 86% are very concerned. If, is there a plan, a distribution plan? And if so, could, that, could we know what it is? The Honourable Member, this government has been focused on our response to COVID-19. We're co cooperating with all levels of government to ensure that the adequate PPE is made available. Our efforts over the past six months will bear fruit and pay off this fall. We have set up a parallel supply chains. We are calling on Canadian businesses again to retool and beef up their production capacity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government is needlessly using national security rules to hide which Canadian companies are being awarded contracts for PPE. Why can't we know how much we're paying for disposable masks? Why can't we know which Canadian company is supplying them? This doesn't seem like a national security issue for the government. It seems more likely to be an ethical insecurity issue for the Liberals. Why won't the Liberals tell us who's getting what and for how much? Secretary to the Minister of Public Services. Well, of course, transparency and accountability are critically important to our government, and we're committed to releasing a full account of all our procurement efforts, and we will absolutely do that for Canadians. But I don't know if the Honourable Member is suggesting that supplies that are uh, in critical shortages worldwide or, or where we are actually competing with other jurisdictions for critical procurements. I don't know if he's suggesting that Canada should uh, make public that critical information. We won't be doing that, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We, what we will be doing is strategically procuring the medical equipment, the PPE required for Canadians and our health professionals to keep us safe. Here. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Mr. Speaker. Who's out there in the field? It's the doctors on the front lines. And they've said that masks and surgical gowns are necessary for each and every interaction. That was true before. Before, that was true even before the current surge in cases. So there's a problem and doctors are concerned. So we want more transparency. What is the plan currently to protect Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we are working and we're very confident in our plans. We're confident that our efforts over the past six months 
to generate our supply capacity around PPE and medical equipment. We're confident that those efforts will continue to pay off for Canadians. I don't know if the member opposite wants this to fail, but I would say that our guardian angels when it comes to supply procurement, our inspectors, our regulators, they are also our guardian angels who are protecting us, and we thank them. We're very confident in them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, we are now in the second wave of COVID. I'd like the Minister of Procurement to assure us that the problems with uh, procurement of uh, PPE and equipment have been corrected. There was some, a constituent of mine who's, uh, who, who was lost in the system during the first wave. Can the minister ensure us that uh, liberal cronies are not being f given f preferential treatment? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We are working hard right now, Mr. Speaker, to ensure continuity of supply to our health professionals for all Canadians. We have set up a parallel supply chain. And of course, we are calling on everyone who believes they can supply us equipment or services that will help in the effort. We would ask them to indicate that they are available to help us out, and we will continue to build Canada's capacity to equip itself with this equipment. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg. It's a bit strange. A liberal, former liberal gets a contract, but in our writings, no contract. But Frank Bayliss, a liberal, gets a multi-million dollar contract. Can the Liberals tell us whether contracts are going to their cronies, yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Minister of Innovation delivered the good news the other day by saying that 50 percent of supply of procurement is currently within Canada. Calgary, who are supplying us with hand sanitizer. We can thank enterprises like Lumen Ultra in New Brunswick, who are providing us with reagent. We can thank businesses from all over the country that are calling, that are heeding the call to action and coming to the rescue of Canadians and our health care professionals. They should be ashamed over there. The Honourable Member for Joliet. The government House Leader just showed disrespect to my colleague because there are a lot of businesses in the red zone in Quebec that are in danger of going belly up. Could the Minister just answer my question out of respect to these businesses that have to close for a month and might go under? Will the federal government join in Quebec's program to support fixed costs? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there are times in history where leadership is recognized, and, and this is seen in how a party reacts to a crisis. The Bloc has failed on that score. The Bloc wants to make sure that the elections don't occur after the spring of 2021. What if there are more cases in the spring of 2021? What if more Quebecers are still looking for work? Their priority is to go to the polls. That's profoundly disappointing. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, I'm speechless. A government needs the government's, needs the House's confidence but the, gover the government should at least answer the question out of respect for bars and restaurants that are in danger of going, going into bankruptcy. He just wants to play petty politics. But those businesses are in danger. The federal government should partake in Quebec's assistance program to cover fixed costs, because the federal programs, the criteria are all too restrictive. So my question is, what is the government going to do? Do they care about these businesses at all? The Honourable Government House Leader, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, while the Bloc gets ready for the next election, we're taking action on behalf of our businesses and our seniors and our workers who've lost their jobs. We are working for restaurants and tourism. Those are concrete ways of responding. 
They can always get ready for the next election as much as they like. But meanwhile, we are going to have the backs of Quebecers. Mr. Speaker, the second wave of coronavirus is turning into a tsunami because the Prime Minister has failed to get Canadians rapid testing. And this is insane because the Parliamentary Secretary to Health actually has a rapid testing company in his own constituency wow. in Dartmouth. This wow. is crazy. Either the Prime Minister wants the economy to completely shut down, people to miss family dinners, or he's just blindly incompetent. These tests aren't coming because of their failures. Which one is it? Oh, Parliament Secretary of the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, as I've said, we have been at the table with our provincial and territorial counterparts to help them respond to COVID-19. We've been very clear with every jurisdiction that testing, contact tracing, and timely data are key to responding to outbreaks. Mr. Speaker, not only have we provided billions of dollars through our Safe Restart program to increase capacity of testing, we have also ordered 7.9 million Abbott tests, rapid tests that will begin arriving in the next few weeks with 2.5 million of these tests here by December 31st. Here, here. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. That's months away. This guy has a rapid testing company in his own backyard and didn't even think to raise it with the minister months ago. You know who this impacts? The elderly. What the Prime Minister is doing with this is saying long-term care facilities have to be locked down. Aging and elderly people have to stay in their homes. That's the only tool we have because we can't frequently and rapidly test each other. Why? Why has the Prime Minister allowed becoming elderly or being aged become a prison sentence in Canada. The Honourable... Somebody? Not sure who's... The Honourable Minister, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Well, of course, as an integral part of our plan to safely restart our economy, we're securing the testing supplies, including, as my colleague says, up to approximately 8 million tests from Abbott ID now to meet our needs now for the long term and increase our capacity to test more Canadians. But, Mr. Speaker, what I'm perplexed about is we spent six months procuring the equipment that we need, and we're confident about that. We spent six months uh, uh, building our domestic capacity. We've spent six months assisting and, and being side by side with our provinces. What is it about yes, yes, and yes that they don't get over there? Honourable member for Kildonan St. Paul. Speaker, Sherry Santiago is dying of stage 4 cancer. Her dying wish is to be reunited with her sister, her best friend, to be by her side in her final moments. But her sister is in the Philippines and has been denied entry into Canada by this Liberal government. Surely there is a way we can ensure Sherry and her sister are reunited safely. Canadians are tired of the talk and endless promises of details to come. They want answers and they want them now. Where is the compassion? Where is the plan? Herbal, Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since we introduced a process to reunite families last June, we've been working on ways to address additional families and compassionate cases. I know it's been a long and challenging wait, but we're working very closely with health and border agencies and across federal and provincial governments to find solutions. I know that cases like the one like my honourable colleague just mentioned are inspiring our work, and we hope to have more to say very shortly. Thank you. The honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. I think inspiring is the absolute wrong word to use. So, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have been announcing reuniting families for months and still nothing. Canadians deserve the dignity and clarity of timelines. No more details coming soon. Donna McCall was dying of cancer and her children were denied entry into Canada. As she took her last breath, her husband held her hand and in his other hand had his children on FaceTime on his iPhone. This is not the Canada I know. The Liberals have allowed billionaires on private jets into this country, but they won't allow people who are dying to be reunited with their loved ones one last time. It is unacceptable. Where is the plan? Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Mr. Speaker, if my honourable colleague was listening, what I said was that the cases like the one she'd mentioned were inspiring us to continue to reunite as many families as possible. And on this side of the House, we do believe in compassion, but we have to exercise that compassion responsibly. We will always stand up for families when it comes to our immigration system while not compromising the health and safety of Canadians during the pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, this year was the worst returning run of Fraser River sockeye in recorded history. The minister 
can't both promote open net salmon farms and claim to be a protector of Pacific wild salmon. Open net pen farms increase the risk of disease and sea lice in wild salmon. By choosing to defend these farms, the minister is ignoring local and Indigenous knowledge and the Cohen Commission, a $36 million scientific study. When will the Liberals make good on their promise and remove the promotion of open net fish farms from the Department of Fisheries mandate? The, sure, we got the Honourable Minister or Parliamentary Secretary. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wild Pacific salmon is a priority for our government to British Columbians and to all Canadians. So I want to be very clear. Our government is committed to transitioning away from open net pen fin fish aquaculture in British Columbia in a responsible way. Part of that responsibility is to consult meaningfully with affected First Nations, and that is exactly what our government is doing. We also need to work with the province of British Columbia, as we know all parties want to see a plan that is timely, workable, and economically feasible. We are doing that work, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for South Okanagan and West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to hear that the government will support regional airline routes that are essential for ridings like mine. We know airlines are going through a tough time, but I want assurance that any direct support also require that the airlines provide refunds for travellers who have been given only vouchers in return for cancelled flights. Every MP has heard from travellers who now have vouchers worth thousands of dollars that they may never be able to use. The minister passed a law that clearly states passengers must be compensated in cash. So while supporting airlines, will he also support everyday Canadians? The Honourable Parliament Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. We've heard from all of our constituents across the country the concerns uh, that our constituents face, and no Canadian should have to choose between uh, paying for rent and having income insecurity as a result of um, unable to receive refunds. Um, the Minister's office continues to work with um, airlines across the country uh, to ensure a solution. We will continue to work with them and hope to have more information uh, um, in the coming uh, in the coming weeks and months. Well, do you think that the Liberals actually answer the questions today? No. Uh, Trump again. He's going to do a statement coming up pretty sh today. Boris Johnson from the UK had it. Leave it comments below and have a good day. Stay tuned for part two of Question Period. Have a good day.